Ok, muy bien. Vamos, let's get started. Let me find my window here. Hello everyone, buenos días. We are looking forward to this presentation. Uh, it will be mostly in English, so hopefully everyone can follow along. But please uh, put any questions in the chat and we will try to respond. And we'll also save time for questions and answers at the end of our session. Okay, so what we'll cover today is uh, a bit of background, working from home, working while traveling and living abroad, and remote UX processes and tools that have been um, revised for remote working, obviously. So each of these chapters could be its own presentation, so we're going to keep things super high level and general, because we only have a half an hour. Um, but we're hoping you'll come away with inspiration and a little bit of entertainment as well. And it's our first time giving this presentation, so please feel free to share any feedback. So we'll start with a little bit of our background. You know, who are we and what gives us the, you know, the experience to give this talk? Well, I'm Crispin Bailey. I'm the Director of Design and User Experience for Kalamuna, uh, a web agency we'll talk about in a minute. There, I lead the design and strategy team. And I've been doing web design for about, well, almost 25 years. And I've been designing Drupal websites since Drupal 4.6. So I know that that dates me a little bit. I also have a background in graphic design, project management, QA testing, and a university degree in English and film studies. And sometimes I like to DJ at Drupal parties. I speak English, French, y un poquito español. And I also love to travel. And this is a photo of me in the desert near Borrego Springs, California. Okay, hey, hello everybody. I'm Patricia Rodriguez. I am a senior user experience designer for Calamuna. And I've been doing web design since the early 2000s. I also have a multidisciplinary background and education in fine arts, graphic design, and the humanities. And I've been working remotely with Calamuna for almost four years. And currently, I live in Canada, and it's autumn right now, as you can see in the picture. And uh, I'm also a nature lover. So, también habla, um, hablo un poco de español, y buenos días para todos. So, a little, about, a little bit about Calamuna, because this is uh, how we're able to do this talk. It's related very much. Um, Calamuna is a digital agency that focuses on web design and development for mission-focused organizations. We have deep roots in the Drupal community, and we have been key organizers and sponsors of the Bay Area Drupal Camp, called Bad Camp, that takes place every October in Berkeley, California. Except, of course, for this year, when it was virtual, like this conference. Our agency likes to do good and have fun doing it because people are at the heart of everything we do. It was originally founded in Oakland, California, but we're now an international and distributed company since we opened a second office in Toronto, Canada. But even with two offices, and we have office space in Oakland, most of the team has been working remotely for many years and even since before COVID. But you may be wondering, what were we doing before Kalamuna? Well, I grew up in Toronto, so for most of my professional life, I've had jobs in this really big city. It's like over 6 million people when you count the surrounding areas. And before I joined Kalamuna, I was working for another Drupal-focused agency in Toronto. And for that job, I had to go into the office every day. And it was really challenging working there because it was all an open concept office, and I was in a senior position. So that meant I was in a lot of meetings, mostly video and phone calls. So either I was distracting my coworkers or they were distracting me. And I was working as the only dedicated UX practitioner for the government of Ontario at the time. And most days I was also in a small shared office space uh, in this beautiful building here in downtown Toronto. So, but luckily I got to work um, from home one to two days a week. And on these days, I was so much more productive because it was so distracting in that small space. But um, all of our usability studies, we did do in person at the time. But before all that, 
we were living semi-nomadically for several years, which meant we moved a lot. And our home base was wherever we happened to be at the time. During that time, we did freelance web design and development projects. We created and launched our own iOS apps, our iPhone apps. We developed and ran a community website and we launched a startup. So we've traveled and worked across Canada, down the west coast of the continent, all the way down to the Yucatan in Southern Mexico and went all the way back again. And we lived in some fabulous places that we were only able to live in because we were flexible and mobile. And it was hard because we did it before Airbnb. Uh, there wasn't any ways, so we couldn't, we had to use paper maps, which were often wrong. Uh, not everybody had smartphones yet and uh, responsive websites were still cutting edge. So right now, except for COVID, it's never been easier to work abroad or live nomadically and work. But there are things to keep in mind and uh, it's not as awesome as it seems. There's some really big challenges. Um, so we're going to go over a few of these things. And um, we've also done quite a bit of work travel, either for conferences, meetings or workshops. And um, we're also a couple who sometimes works together like we do right now. And there are pros and cons for this as well. And we could do a whole talk on that, but we're not going to. Um, but here's what we've learned over the years about working remotely. So we'll start by talking about you know, working from home. Some of the pros, um, you know, one big bonus, we, we moved outside of the big city. And one big bonus that you can that you might have if you're able to move away from your office is you can move to somewhere that works better for you. So when we lived in Toronto, we were both living and working from an open concept, one bedroom apartment. And it was a house that was separated into three different apartments. I worked in the bedroom, Patricia worked in the dining room. And it was really hard to escape the distractions when someone was having a meeting. And it also felt like we lived in our office sometimes. But because we were both remote workers, we were able to move. So one and a half years ago, we moved to this little city called Cambridge, which is about an hour by car from Toronto. And just by moving out of the city, instead of having a one bedroom apartment, we were able to move into a three bedroom place so we could each have our own office, which has been a dream. Um, we even have a backyard, which is another dream. So that's kind of amazing. We couldn't have done that in Toronto. And uh, we're also closer to nature trails. So it's been a nice improvement for us. Of course, Toronto is amazing and stuff. Um, but for us, the priority was to have a, a comfortable living and working environment uh, and have as much nature as we can around us. So some of the pros from working from uh, home is you don't have to commute anymore, and which means you've got more time. You can do fun things. You can have hobbies that maybe you weren't able to have in the city, like uh, to do something physical or fun and grounding, like gardening, which is Crispin's new hobby. That's a lot of fun most of the time. <laughs> some other pros, uh, when you're able to um, set up your own workstation, you can customize it to your own needs. So in this example, on the picture on the left, you can see I have my laptop up on a riser and I have an external monitor, which is great for design work. And this, this setup gives me the option to travel with a laptop so it's flexible. I also wanna, you know, we also think it's important that you have a good adjustable chair. This is a really big deal when you're on a computer all day. Other things are, you know, you can have good lighting, friendly plants, and you can see on the picture on the right, I recently installed a standing desk. So now I can mix up sitting and standing, which is much healthier for me. And it's uh, something I recommend. And this is my current setup. So uh, I have this uh, desk I got secondhand with this amazing adjustable keyboard tray, which is also good for uh, trackpad, mouse, uh, but in particular, I use a tablet a lot, like the stylus and uh, it's been really uh, a really nice thing for design work um, and on the picture on the right recently i put my monitor up on a riser which has been great so i, I sit a little taller now uh, and just some pillows behind my seat because that styly seat isn't actually super ergonomic even though it's adjustable so just filling out the back with some lumbar support has been really good 
little pro tip. Um, you can use a bar table as a stand-up desk. It might be easier to run, come across one. Um, and it can use a serve a dual purpose. Here's a dual purpose. This is our dining room table, which is just a little bar table. But every once in a while, you know, you might have to move your workstation in your home for different reasons. So it's really good to have these versatile spaces. Um, and for my laptop, when I'm traveling, especially or doing something like this, I always find an object to put it up. Otherwise, I'm bent over too much. So a bowl, sometimes like a, a pan from the kitchen, whatever you can find that's high enough, some books um, and a separate keyboard, even just for, for at home, I find it super helpful if I have to move my, my workstation around. Oh, and those bar stools too, they're adjustable. So I'm not super tall. That's not a good standing desk for me, but I can get my, my seat to a nice height. Now, while it's tempting to work on the couch, try not to do it too much. We all love working on couches, right? That's what you think. I'm at home, I'll work on the couch, I'll be more comfy. But if you do too much of that, uh, it can be a bad thing for your back. And I once had to miss a, work of, a week of work to go to physio, and, and I had to go to physio for a month after spending too much time working on the couch because I developed a really bad back pains. Um, and this was when I was younger, so I don't do that anymore. This picture was from a few years back. But another challenge from working home is separating your work from your home life. And at our last apartment, you can see here, I was at, at the end of, I was basically in the bedroom. So at the end of each workday, I would take a big sheet of plastic, thin sheet of plastic uh, that was rigid, and I would use it to put in front of my workspace so that it was blocked off and we didn't have to look at it while we were in bed. So creativity with shelving and screens and plants was super helpful. This was my workstation, which was in the dining room. So we didn't have to stare at it when we were in the living room. So, so we had to eat in the living room, but that's okay. Um, so there's lots of neat things that people can do with, with uh, furniture to make a workspace a little bit more hidden and partitioned in an open space. Um, but the main challenge was I was across from the fridge and the fridge got really noisy with a fridge buzz that drove me, just got me so, oh, I couldn't even work, it was so loud. So we put in a little smart plug behind the fridge and every time it got loud while it was working, I could just say, hey Siri, turn off the fridge. So that was a, a little hack that really helped out. We also had a timer set for that smart plug to turn back on at a certain time of day. So in case we forgot, uh, all of our food wouldn't go warm and get spoiled. Anyways, little hacks, right? So we do have a few more tips, tricks, and hacks to share. Uh, one is, um, you can see I'm backlit here, but my face you can still see. It's important that you um, position your desk so that you get sunlight on your face, not your monitor. But if that's not gonna work, you can use a desk lamp or reading lamps to fill in the lighting so your face is adequately illuminated for video calls. Uh, it might be nice to put something interesting but not too distracting in the background to provide some personality. And uh, get some really good noise canceling headphones, um, ideally with noise canceling microphones so that you can eliminate distractions from the outside world um, and also eliminate distractions from your colleagues if there's noise happening on your side. And if you can't close the door to your workspace, another thing we recommend is, you know, just drape a cloth or a blanket over top of your desk and your computer. So you're not reminded of work and tempted to, you know, go and check on things, you know, when you really should be taking a break. And we've got a lot more tips and tricks to share on the Kalamuna blog. We did a post about it and all the Kalamuna people who had tips kind of suggested them. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Okay, working while traveling and living abroad. We were gonna separate these initially into two chapters, but we only have a half an hour. So we've combined them, so let's get into it. When you think of traveling, do you think of blue skies? 
or enjoying different kinds of craft beers and strange local drinks in beautiful settings. Going out for amazing tacos and crazy burgers or exploring new places with workmates. Or even going out for, to fun restaurants with your friends. Well, all that's possible. And, you know, some people may want to escape to the tropics and the warm, sunny weather. Others may want to go north and experience a winter wonderland. So it's always nice to see these beautiful travel pics, but there's a reality of travel that we all love forgetting, which is travel is exhausting. And there are a lot of logistics to deal with before going, while traveling, while you're there, and then after you return. So doing the packing, preparing, traveling, getting set up um, where you, when you get there, that takes about three days. Sometimes it takes more. And then about three days for the way back for the same thing. So it's almost a disruption of about six days for every trip. Um, and sometimes that means you don't get a weekend to recover. So um, if your trip is short, you may not have to worry about who's going to water your plants or feed your pets. But longer trips um, take even more thought and preparation. So for example, when you're going to be traveling, it can be risky in certain areas. And you have to be prepared for that. So think about dressing casually in casual clothes and trying to fit in with the locals. And you know, look for ways to hide or camouflage your valuables when you're leaving your apartment or your hotel room. Uh, you really have to treat your laptops especially like, like treasures. If they go missing, you're screwed. So we've, we've done all sorts of hacks. Uh, once that, when we were in Mexico, Patricia came up with a system to wrap our laptops in newspapers so that if we left them on the table, it just looked like a pile of newspapers. Um, things like that, um, you know, doesn't hurt to be a little paranoid. Yeah, where we lived, a lot of people got their stuff stolen. It was just a normal thing that happened all the time. So, um, but it was so nice there. So there's always, you know, we have to weigh these things when we travel, uh, including the weather. So, you know, we have winters in Canada, which are kind of brutal at times. But, um, you know, there's things like hurricanes to be prepared for um, while traveling or living abroad. And that was a whole learning curve for us. So just another, another thing to consider. So when it comes to packing, you know, just a little bit of advice. Try to pack a light. Pack everything you'll need but only what you're certain you will need. Basically, pack as light as you can and save some space to bring back souvenirs. So here's another one, a longer trip. Uh, it was actually a three month trip we were away. And um, if you're traveling with a big electronics, like here we had a printer and we also had an iMac, um, it's really good to pack them in their original box that has all the nice styrofoam and stuff and then put them in the special oversized and fragile luggage so that they get handled carefully, uh, they don't get stolen or damaged. So this is a tricky trip because when we got to Edmonton it was summer and then we left it was minus 10 so it's really hard to, to pack for winter. I don't know if you've ever packed a parka but it's, you know, big winter clothes are really cumbersome. And in order to live abroad, we had to let go most of our stuff, including our furniture, clothes, kitchen, appliances, and stuff like that. Um, but the stuff that was really important to us, we kept in a secure, climate-controlled uh, locker. That was important because we had archival material, because I have a lot of art that I made over the years. Kristen has a big record collection. Um, and we did that outside of Toronto because it was cheaper to do it in Toronto. And this little storage locker you see here, um, was that stuff was there for three years. So I've heard people having their stuff who do this travel remotely and, and work, they, they end up having these storage lockers for a long time. So get a secure one with climate control and um, yeah, try to get a good deal if you can. So here, here are some other things you're gonna need to think about depending on the length of your trip. 
Um, you want to find a place to stay with a good work setup. So fast internet, a desk or table and chair to work at. And if you can, um, try and get the place where you're going to stay to do a speed test so you can make sure it's going to be a good internet speed. Uh, make sure you got your travel visa, your passport and all your vaccines and your travel insurance, different currency and money requirements to think about. You might have to find somebody to look after your place while you're away, you know, bring in the mail, water the plants, feed the cat, that sort of thing. Don't forget to clear out your fridge before you go and take out the trash. You don't want to come back to stinky garbage. And when you're packing, think about clothes that will suit the destination. So we, we talked about, you know, dressing casually, but make sure you also have at least, you know, a couple shirts for meetings if you have to go on video calls. And bring some gifts for colleagues and friends who you may see when you're there or that you may meet when you're there. And always make sure to schedule time for packing and unpacking and recovering from your trip because as we said earlier, it is exhausting. So what we really like when we travel um, is to have relaxing mornings. So bringing breakfast essentials is always really nice, especially when you're somewhere strange and having to run out the door to find breakfast can be tricky for some people. Um, so uh, Crispin really likes this hand grinder um, from Hiro or ha Hario. Is that a Japanese? Yes. I think. Yeah. Anyways, so he always travels with that, makes the mornings really nice. Um, having, I bring tea. And having things like uh, that can pack like instant oatmeal and granola bars, especially if you arrive somewhere at three in the morning and you're really hungry because of the time differences, just having these little little snacks is really helpful too. And uh, this is a nice work setup for a short trip. Um, that was an Airbnb we stayed at not too long ago. Uh, so there's the, a nice little, little bowl I had to find to put my laptop on. Um, so it's really important though when you stare at these Airbnbs, if you move the stuff around to, to move it back because your hosts will either think it's stolen or they'll you know, give you a bad rating. So um, just to, to be conscientious with those kind of things. But there's usually something you can find to make your, your workstation a little more ergonomic um, in a pinch. A few more tips, tricks, and hacks for traveling and working abroad. Try to get advice from locals, ideally before you go. If you know anybody down there, you know, get on a call and ask them about like, well, wh what neighborhoods are good to stay in? What neighborhoods should we avoid? That sort of thing. Um, like I said earlier, get a speed test report from the place you're going to stay at because you don't want to find out once you get there that the internet sucks and you can't work. Um, pack a small extension cord along with all your cables because you'd be surprised how hard it is to find enough plugs to plug in all the things you need to charge every day. Um, bring your own kitchen knives. Guaranteed, wherever you go, they're going to have shitty kitchen knives and kitchen utensils. So if you have favorites and you like to cook, bring, what, bring your favorites. And also consider bringing small LED candles. We bring these wherever we go. They're great because most hotels and Airbnbs and apartments and places you stay have really awful lighting, to be honest, for evenings. When you just want to relax, have it kind of a little bit, you know, chill. Um, but little LED candles are great for that. And you can carry them around. They're really light and you don't need to light them <laughs> like a real candle. As Patricia mentioned earlier, bring snacks that are compact and don't require refrigeration. So you can always have them in your backpack in case you get hungry somewhere and you just don't have, there's nothing else to eat around. Um, bring plenty of toiletries. So that's like toothpaste and deodorants and things like that. Like consider bringing extras um, because you might not be able to get your favorites wherever you're going. And of course, bring any medication or vitamins that you're used to taking. And this next tip, always have a photocopy of your passport. This is kind of, a, this is a, an important one because it's really important when you're traveling to have identification on you, but you don't want to lose your identification like a passport. And having a photocopy is usually good enough if you get stopped at a checkpoint or like when we were just sitting on the beach uh, in Hako, we got approached by the, by the police and they're like, let's see your papeles. And we're like, okay, we brought out our photocopies and they were okay with that. And then you leave your real passport somewhere safe, hopefully in a lockbox or a, a safe at the place you're staying. Now, 
when you're on the plane and you're actually traveling, you don't want to get sick. You're probably, you know, a little bit prepared because of the COVID pandemic, but you want to have a mask, hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes for on the plane. So just because anything you can do to prevent getting sick will make for a better trip. Yeah, I used to always get sick every time I jumped on a plane until I started wearing masks. This was before COVID, so uh, I'm an expert germaphobe now, but um, I highly recommend doing that even when the COVID's over if you're prone to getting sick on planes. So we spent over two years in the Yucatan and about four years living in the semi-nomadic way, and it was hard, but it was a really great learning experience that we recommend um, you can do it in your own country too. Costa Rica is amazing. So, you know, lots of good opportunities, um, of exciting places to live. But this is the Drupal camp. <laughs> so let's talk about websites and how to make them. So we're working remote while, oh, Patricia, I'm getting echo from you. Oh, really? Oh, sure. Can you, what can I do? You, Yes. Mute. Oh, it stopped. Okay. Weird audio glitch. Anyways, working remotely definitely has challenges, but in some cases we found that things can actually be better when they're done remotely. For example, stakeholder interviews. Interviews are great to do remotely. For interviews, we always do them with voice only, no video. And the reason is because the person we interview, uh, that way they're not self-conscious and they're more comfortable in their own space. And we all just focus on the conversation instead of what's in the background. We always try to have two people conducting these interviews. So there's one person who's the main moderator and the second person is a co-moderator and a backup if anything goes wrong, technical glitches or issues. And they're also there to listen and take notes and sometimes ask additional questions if clarification is required. Now, another important thing to is to record the interview. This makes transcription easier later, and you can go back uh, and refer to the conversation later on. But it also allows you to focus on the interview while you're doing it, instead of trying to type everything out. Okay, uh, usability testing, also known as user testing, is also pretty great to do remotely. I've done these in person uh, for more formal user testing uh, sessions and people have to travel to get to you. They have to come into a strange environment, sometimes work on a computer they've never used before. Sometimes they're even in a room with like a, like a mirror with all this whole audience behind there staring at them. So it's very unnatural and they get very nervous. Um, but doing it from home, um, they're comfortable. They're in their own environments, on their own computers. There's nobody sitting next to them. So we found that these sometimes even work better than the in-person ones. And also sketching workshops. So these are super helpful when you have stakeholders who have ideas they want to share. And they're great to do with a small mixed group that includes different perspectives, like a designer, a developer, project uh, manager, um, project product owner, uh, marketing executives, they love it. Um, but small groups are better. So if you can make sure it's under eight people, that, that's much more effective. Once they get big, they become really long and um, you, know, you don't want a meeting longer than two hours and people get really exhausted. So, but we often sketch just one important page or tool. And um, if we need to schedule another workshop, we can do that um, to do a round two. But uh, we could get more into this if you're interested, um, but we gotta keep moving. Okay, when it comes to information architecture and things like wireframing, um, you can do this remotely as well. So for working on these parts of the project, we usually like to use Google Docs and Sheets for some of the deliverables like sitemaps and taxonomies. They're easy to share and collaborate with um, because most people are familiar with those applications. For content mapping, we use a tool called Lucidchart. It's, it's, and we'll talk more about um, the tools we use later, but it's easy and collaborative and sometimes our clients collaborate directly with us on these documents. And then once we have our content map ready, we might do some validation with users by conducting card sorting or tree testing exercises using, again, online tools so we can do this remotely. 
uh, from these tools from Optimal Workshop. And then when we get into wireframing, we use Figma. And sometimes we'll make clickable prototypes from those wireframes to use for user testing. Then when it comes to mockups and style tiles and other types of visual design, we also use Figma. We use Figma for a lot of things now. In fact, just over a, about a year and a half ago, we switched completely to Figma. So we also use it for prototyping things like hover states, drop down menus, sticky navigation bars. And we can do user testing with these prototypes too, using either the wireframes or mockups. And because it has a presentation mode, we also use it for all our design reviews, both internally and with, with our team and with our clients. And clients love the ability to send them, we can just send them a link to a prototype and then they can add their feedback using the comment tool, putting the pins right on the places they wanna give us feedback about. So most of our tools are cloud-based and collaborative tools. That means we can work together on documents at the same time, even if we're thousands of kilometers apart. Our two, most our two most used communication tools are Slack and Google Meet. But to accommodate our clients, sometimes we have to use uh, any number of other tools. Like we've used pretty much all the video conferencing tools at this point. And when it comes to documentation, file sharing, and presentations, we like to use the Google Work suite of tools. Right, because our whole office is distributed, this has been just the go-to set of apps for most of the work we do. But we also use a lot of different tools for UX research, depending on the project. And here are some of our favorites. So when we do those stakeholder interviews, we use GoToMeeting because it allows us to record the calls and it provides free automated transcriptions so we don't have to uh, do it ourselves or pay for a service. And it allows users, um, when we're doing user tests, to share their screen without having to restart the application. And it's just a lot easier for them to get going. We use Google Forms whenever we do a survey, analytics, of course, to look at the analytics, and but Hotjar to create heat maps. All these are web-based tools, so you can use them and set them up from anywhere. And like I was saying earlier, when we're doing uh, tree testing or uh, card testing, we use optimal workshops. And we can also do remote user testing using usertesting.com. And that supports both moderated and unmoderated. Now, of course, we always prefer to do moderated, but in a pinch, um, we've had to use uh, unmoderated uh, and it's worked out really well. So when it comes to uh, design, uh, these are some of the tools we rely on. Once again, Lucidchart, amazing for diagrams, cloud-based, supports multiple users. Uh, less powerful than OmniGrapple, but makes up for it by being better for collaboration. So also does something fancy that tools like Figma can't do. It connects two shapes with a line, which is great for our maps that we need to make. Uh, gather content, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's a tool that we use quite a bit when there's a lot of new content to develop and there isn't a CMS like Drupal to work with yet, or we aren't sure what content types we need yet. So it's something that we can use with the client quite easily. And of course, Figma as well. So we want to mention a few other helpful UX tools. Again, you can use all these remotely, but not everything is going to be software based in, you know, or cloud based software. Sticky notes, they're not just for the office. We bring a pack of stickies wherever we go because you never know when you're going to need them. And don't forget to bring your Sharpies. Okay, whiteboards. We brought a whiteboard with us across North America and all the way down to Mexico and back because um, they're so handy. Sometimes you just need to write things on a wall. Um, so highly recommend having your own little whiteboards around your home office if possible, if you're into that sort of thing. We've got three. <laughs> and finally, we have to mention the iPad because once they came out with support for the, and they, they came out with the Apple Pencil, it was a real game changer. Suddenly it became a powerful creative tool as well as a, cons uh, as well as a you know tool to you know watch videos, so we use it to sketch, do research, and read the latest UX design books and articles. And it's also great for taking on the plane as a media device. Conclusion: Remote UX can be great, but there are 
are, of course, some things that are better done in person. Well, thank you. Gracias. That is our presentation. Um, we wanted to also just mention that uh, we're open to taking questions. I see in the comments, we got a question from Gen Z. Uh, do you use Jira or what project management software do you use? That's a great question. And we, we, we did have a slide for that stuff, but we, we cut it in the, in the interest of time. We use both Jira and Trello. Typically we will use uh, Jira for big projects, uh, especially if there's a lot of members on them. And when we're running our projects in sprints, you're doing you know, Scrum, but sometimes we use um, Trello to manage internal projects, some marketing initiatives, things that are more Kanban-like in terms of how we're running those projects. Okay, question from Beto. Do you have any techniques or methods for sketching workshops online? Yes, Beto, you missed it. <laughs> we had a section it, but on yes. that. Well, I'll we'll elaborate a little bit. What we do is we usually send uh, the, we give people homework. So they do their sketch. It works out better, we find, if they do their sketches on their own time, and then they send us their sketches by email and then we put them into a Google Slides presentation and set it all up. So when we come, everybody comes for the workshop, we can review the sketches one at a time and, and then you know, go back around and have a discussion. And then following that discussion in that workshop, we might have uh, decide that we wanna do a round two. And again, we'll do that as like homework. So people have a couple of days to let their ideas kind of you know, gel give them an opportunity to do their sketch, and then we'll get together again for like a follow-up. And um, there's a lot of, yeah, ACE works so much better. We had it once where everybody sketched at the same time. Everyone had five minutes to sketch really quickly, and then they had bad sketches that were just scribbly and not well thought out. So the homework really worked well. Um, and uh, of course, you have to have your moderator and everything timed like clockwork so it's quite a bit of setup time but when it's set up really well it's it's very smooth and the client uh, has a really nice time especially if they have the homework because then they feel prepared and kind of not, not put on the spot so um, and even if they don't do their homework they can still participate in reviewing everybody's um, so it, it usually works out I just uh, we recommend not having more than eight people on one of these because then the meeting gets really long yeah, the more people you have sketching, the more time it takes to review, the more time it takes to ask questions. Um, and one other thing we'll, we'll point out, we generally, um, when we give the homework, we tell people to try and do it in less than an hour for a couple of reasons. One, it's so that they don't think of, you know, put it off because it's, oh, it's going to take me forever. Like just focus your time, take an hour at the max and just do whatever you can in that time. And so that makes it easier for the participants. And it also makes the sketch more focused on what's important. We also show them a few examples of sketches because some people are self-conscious about their sketching skills. And the reality is sometimes you don't even have to draw anything. You can just write a list of concepts or words in a certain order on a page and that will you know, represent what you're trying to get at. So showing a few examples really, really like like some a pretty pretty one and then like a really some really basic ones then they can feel comfortable that they can uh, fit in somewhere sometimes they need to see a few examples to understand what what they might do all right any more questions okay then we're going to wrap things up Let's see here, where's my, where's my notes? Okay, there we go. So we wanted to just give a couple image credits. Uh, most of the photography, most of the images were photos we took ourselves, uh, but there were two images that were clearly not. So we wanted to call that out. And finally, we'd love it if you connected with us either by email, Twitter, or on LinkedIn. We'd love to have, uh, make more friends, make more connections, 
And if you have any follow-up questions or feedback, we'd love to hear it. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this is our first time doing this. So we'd love to hear your feedback and let us know if there's anything that we missed that we could do to make it better next time. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great bad camp. Or <laughs> Duplicat. That's Bay Area Duplicat. This is a different Duplicat Costa Rica. Oh, I'm supposed to mention do the polls. Don't forget to do the polls. <laughs> All right. Pura vida. Bye, everybody. Muchas gracias. Ciao.